come to art, culture, and things in between with me, Rose October. The goal of this, this supposedly two hour program on Sundays at three to five is to focus on just that art, culture, and things in between. Each week, there will be a featured interview or discussion. And it will be with someone who is driving arts and culture in our community. This week, I am honored to have this guest. His name is Andrew Clark. Uh, so for those of you who have never heard of Andrew, you'll see him and hear from him today. And those of you who love you some Andrew, you'll get some more of him today. And we'll... We'll just have some real good discussion about our culture and our culture. And I, want to, I want to say to you about my guest, Andrew Clark, that this guy is, I, I just love him, I'm sorry. He is all one would ever need in a production when it comes to arts and culture because you put a mic in front of him, he can be your best MC. You could tell him sing, and he would be the best singer. Wow. You could tell him act, and he would be the best y act. Believe me, I saw some of his work. Like that. So, I will take a quick break while we see a little clip about Andrew's work. And then I will come back with Andrew and we will have some discussion about art, culture, and, in, and things in between. So we'll take a break now and we'll watch a little clip about Andrew Clark in performance. Thank you. That window, well, it's so nice to see you. Thank nice God time. for for these platforms that we, we can talk. connect, right? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Hey, yes. virtual hug, man. Yes, virtual hug. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you for doing this. There's so much we could talk about. You know, when we meet up, we cannot stop talking. Oh, yeah, man, yeah, man. In yeah, Jamaica, we say we can draw a long day. I mean, we could talk for quite a while. Well, that's what so it means. We could draw around then. 
In Guyanese, you said that person long-winded, but I guess that's pretty much a generic thing. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> long bench. Well, hey, let let the learning begin. Yeah, you know, let the learning begin. So, how are you? I am. I am good. I'm good. I, I'm better than I was some weeks ago. And this is a this is a very um, honest, you know, sort of response because oftentimes when people ask how you're doing, get you say you're good, even if things yeah. are not yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I just say. It's a natural, um, visceral response. It's a kind of trained response. But for me, this has been, and I, and I can imagine for a lot of people, it's been a, quite the adjustment to mm-hmm. you know, this idea of being locked away. So a couple of weeks ago, I found myself in a really, really dark place. And um, yeah, it was it was tough. But since then, you know, I've, I've assessed, I've spoken, you know, with some friends of mine that have given me some perspective. And um, one of the things that has kept me grounded is, we're, we're, we're all going through this in various stages, yeah. you know, um, and we, we just essentially have to lean on each other and, and find strength in that. Yeah. Let me ask you, and I don't want you to be bashful about this, I need to practice this because I mm-hmm. know sometimes we don't stop to look at the body of work that we're doing and how it has touched the masses. And when we're asked this question, like, who is Andrew Clark? You kind of want to shy away and all of that. <laughs> you know, there's a different space for you on the stage as opposed to you in your apartment or in your bedroom where you know you feel secure. Mm-hmm. Here I'm asking you to be as open and as candid and as vulnerable mm-hmm. as you can mm-hmm. in answering. Who is Andrew Clark? Oh gosh, there are so many facets to Andrew Clark, but I the 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 the, the most obvious part um, about me is that I'm a performer. It's interesting. I moved to New York seven years ago, eleven years ago. Sorry, um, and I moved here from Miami because I wanted to to perform. I was living in 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 Miami at a corporate job. Was able to you know drive off a company car from the lot, but I never felt. I never felt fulfilled. Um, I'd always performed for most of my my young adult life. Um, I through my teenage years, right out of high school, during high school. Um, I never got that space in Miami. Uh, so I moved to New York to be a performer and um, decide, you know, they're going to show up at um, somebody's house, not my house at the time, a colleague. Um, and we start a whole thing we do. And I'm saying that to say, just within a couple months, I'd become a different person altogether without even noticing it. You know, I'd become an, an art leader. I'd become a director, a musical director. Matter of fact, it's so funny. I'm, I'm sitting here with all this time that we have now, um, going over old photographs of the folk singers and of previous performances. And I'm looking at the staging and stuff and I'm thinking what is it Andrew you've been a director all these years but I never saw myself as that in my mind you know director is you go to school you learn directing you come in and you block your as you work you work you work you work you work you work you you know you know you you talk with your design team about costume and lighting all this time I've been doing that all these years but I've never, never thought of myself, myself in that, in that way. way. I wouldn't. I certainly, certainly wouldn't add, add the director on my on my on my portfolio. But I could. I could. I'm really good. I'm looking at the photographs, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking, oh my god, these things were well staged. We actually had proper blocking, <laughs> telling a story. So, I mean, to uh, to answer your question, long and short of it, I would say performer, you know, um, actor, singer. But along the way, I picked up director, um, MC, because of the work that I've been doing with my cultural organization. I've kind of been the front man for the folk singers, oftentimes, you know, telling this the, 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 the stories in between um, songs in our set. Uh, and so uh, a girlfriend of mine, she asked me some years ago, she says, Andrew, I want you to MC an event for me. And I'm like, MC? Me no, 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 MC. I can't do that. She's like, no man, you can do this. I know, I believe in you. And I take myself to Connecticut and I can't forget. I went 
on my my email and went back through all the jokes I'd gotten <laughs> via email from like 2001 in high school when I just printed my email and I printed them all in a, on a piece of paper and I bring them forward and I say, I'm going to tell these jokes. And I, I mean, now years later, I laugh at myself at the, the, the mere idea of printing these canned jokes because everybody would have heard them or seen them before. Um, <laughs> but I've actually become an MC. You know, it's something that people call me now and they, uh, the first thing they ask is, are you available? And how much do you charge? You know, so so many other other things have been added to my arsenal. You know, so I, I, I'm, I'm yes, a little bashful about talking about all the different facets, but I'm, I'm really happy and proud you know, to say that there, there are all these things that I'm, I'm able to, uh, able to do, and I've touched people's lives with them. Yeah. You know, you said, I'm getting goosebumps as you, as you're talking, because as individuals from the Caribbean region, there is a, a homey kind of way that leaders are made. Mm -hmm. And you just talk to that, you know, and we are not the kind of people who would not step back if somebody has the skill to move forward. Mm -hmm. And what I heard you saying was that the individuals with whom you have company saw your talent in leadership, directorship. Mm -hmm. and allowed you to move forward while you are not even thinking or taking mm -hmm. stuff. All you know is that this has to happen. Yeah, right? yeah man, this we has have to a show to do. Right. Let's yes. get this done. That's right. Yeah, This has to happen. The other piece that I picked up from what you said was the importance of geography. It's obvious that you were stifled in mm -hmm. Florida. And then you came to New York and you took off. Um, you know, you mentioned that you, your first gig as MC and all of that. And I really chuckled at that because I'm thinking, I don't think Andrew had to go learn any jokes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? No, me can't MC without a paper. There you go. People, people will call me to MC a gig and they go, oh, I need to send you the bio. And do you need, do you need to know any background information? Yeah. Anything is, and I'm like, just just give me the who, what, where, when, and why on the there go. And yeah, I'm, yeah. Golden. I'm golden. Anything else, I just roll with the punches. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Man, I'm excited about this. And I'm glad that you are allowing yourself to be vulnerable. I'm saying that because mm -hmm. I, I know that you're speaking from the heart too. As you sit here and you reflect, you know, during your sharing. And I really appreciate that. You've hinted to the group, and I know the group is dear to your heart. So mm -hmm. much group, so much so that the group has mushroomed into other things. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a whole business behind this, oh, uh, yes. behind a group right now. And it also speaks to your leadership qualities to envision, think about it. Um, I know that you probably have thought about it, but I'm asking you to stay still for a moment. And think about your reflection just had, right? Fast forward to now, mm -hmm. right? We're talking a business, a business that has trends that really can transcend to so many places in yeah. terms of putting Caribbean culture on the map. You also talk about folk group. And I really admire that part of, of, of what you do because one of the things that we know as keepers of the culture is that our folk arts can easily die if there aren't gatekeepers there. Mm -hmm. So I'm thanking you for being one of those gatekeepers. Uh, the group is called, go ahead. Brata Productions. Brata, 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 Brata Productions is the organization. The group you're, you're we're referring referring to, and the one that people automatically go to is Brata Folk Singers because they're they're essentially our flagship. They're the flag bearers for the organization. But Brata Productions is the nonprofit umbrella that houses that. Okay. So in the next um, segment, I want us to talk a little bit about Brata Productions and Brata uh, folk, folk Singers. But before we do that. 
I just long to hear you sing something, Andrew. <laughs> I, I, I mean, come on. We hear uh, the voice. We know that MC voice. You can stand up and you can you can <laughs> just deliver. We know that. Uh -huh. You know, but sing us a little thing now. Something, a big oh, You yeah. can never ask an, 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 an artist to do a little thing. All you right. Know, so, gonna, so, you know we're going to go all the way. Do a big thing then. Do a big thing. Do a big thing. <laughs> um... Oh gosh, what should I do? Do you want? I don't something? know. The repertoire is so extensive. Uh, so I'm cl I'm classically trained as a as a singer, but I haven't warmed up today. So that's okay. We can take yeah. that. We can take your full voice. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, lordy, lordy, lordy! You you pulled a curveball here. Oh lordy. man, you you expected me not to ask you to do something like that? <laughs> really? All right. So, mm -hmm. um. Here is Ooh, which one? You can do this. You can do this. Andrew, okay. Andrew. Are you hearing the music? Uh-huh. Faintly. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, to heal, and I know he forgives. He bled and died. Just to buy my pardon An empty grave Is there to prove My Savior lives And because he lives I can face tomorrow Because he lives Oh, fear is gone And because I know I know, I know who holds the future. My life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day, I'll cross that river I'll fight life's final Life's final war With pain And then as death Gives way to victory, I'll see the light of glory, and I know He reigns because He lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all my fears are gone. And because I know, I know, I know who holds the future, my life. It is worth the living just my life is worth the living just my life is worth the living just 
because he lives, he lives, he lives. <laughs> love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Listen, how timely, you know. Yeah. You, you, you're smart, you know. You're, kind of, you're, you're smart, you're smart, you're smart. Hear why? Hear why? You're allowing us to testify here too, you know. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know? Because that is, that song, that choice of song, I believe is so timely now when so many people might be losing hope with what's going on around them and i think it, it, it's timely in the sense that if you listen to it pay attention you can begin to believe again yeah, yeah you know so i hear that working for you too yeah, yes definitely, it, definitely. It, is. it is and i felt it man i yeah. felt it i felt it so i think right now would be a good time to take a break because after you do you don't belt all them things and then you <laughs> probably need to take something. a sip of water or something you know <laughs> come back. um so let's take a break and mike is going to play another piece of brata mm -hmm. for our viewership and then we'll come back and we'll talk about Brata production, Brata folk singers, Brata this, Brata that, and Brata all things. <laughs> yeah, right? So take that. a break. Good. Mike, could you pull up something for Brata, please? there we're getting ready to bring back Andrew and I hope you're enjoying watching Rata folk singers in action Andrew are you back with me 
Yes, I am. Okay. How was how was the throat? Good, good, good. It's good. It's good. All right, good. Vocal I, I, I can't promise you that, and I ain't gonna ask you to do another thing. You know, I can't. I can't promise you though. I might ask you to do a little folk thing, but we can see. Um, a little folk thing, I can, I can, I can handle. All right. So, tell us what is Brata Productions. Uh so Sobrata Productions is a non-profit performing arts company and it has a couple prongs. So um initially we started doing theater and theater meant stage readings and those stage readings developed into full productions. Um a couple months later we started the Brata Folk Singers, who used to have an annual uh season at the end of June. Um then it moved to biannual, and since then we've kind of just become a a group for hire um, because it was proving a little more challenging to keep the concert uh, version of, of the company going, of that outfit going. Um, and then since then, we've started Brata Education and Outreach, with, which, which in and of itself has become a couple other prongs um, in the arsenal. So we have after school programming, where currently we're now in two after schools in Queens. Um, uh, senior center programming. So we're in four senior centers where, where we bring a teaching artist to engage the seniors in the creation of artists. The same thing for the after schools. We bring a teaching artist. This year it was um, two dance teachers. In the past, um, we brought dance and theater. For the seniors, we brought them visual arts, dance, theater, uh, singing for, for performance. So quite a few things. And then we also have Banker Caribbean Folk Festival, uh, bank, well, no, Banker Caribbean Culture Festival. That's what it would have been rebranded this year um, had we had it. Um, and then Caribites Festival and Old Time Grand Market, which is our Christmas celebration. Okay. So before we get to the business aspect of Brata Productions, I want us to lean a little on Brata Folk Singers mm -hmm. because I believe that when you listen to the kind of work that Brata Folk Singers do and give, it's so similar mm -hmm. to the other regions. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you go to a Brata um, folk singers production or a program where Brata folk singers are performing, it's like you go back home to oh, your home. Oh Wherever home is, yes. Yeah, man, absolutely. That's, it's always been, I think that's inherently the case with folk performance and, and folk culture in general, because there are some things that I would know growing up as being Jamaican, and you talk to somebody else from another island, it's like, Oh yeah, man, we have that. We just call it a different name. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, there is a dish in Jamaica called um dip and fallback or rundong, which is made with coconut milk and you can either use saltfish, herring, or mackerel. But in another island, I think it's Guyana, it's called Metemji. Oh, it's made with coconut milk and provisions. Mm -hmm. it's part of it. Yeah. Or, or and another place they call it oil dung. Oh, okay. So it's same dish, and yeah. we have a song, a folk song about it. It's called. Well, you know what? Thank you for teaching me that again because mm -hmm. I even know different father. Yes, same thing. If you listen to the preparation of this, it is a dish. Yes, yeah, man. Yeah. So during the song, it tells you now you take a shad of herring and you put it on for soak. You get a bone dry coconut. You don't need no. Pork, your greater down the coconut and put it on for boil till the custard start to settle down from the coconut aisle. So it tells you about the preparation. Of the I never listened to the lyrics. That's the first thing I wake because up. You listen to the fall back. <laughs> it don't fall back. I listen yes. to that. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. It's not even a dance, it's really a celebration of the making of this part. Listen to me. I am sorry. It's different. No, 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 you know what I mean? But listen, give us a little take of that now. So um, so I gave you one verse, then the other okay. one is now you take that shot of herring and you put it on for steam with pepper, tomato, skeleton until it form a cream. No stew beef or mackerel, chicken, pork or sprat can be so sweet when you start to eat the dip and fall back. 
Come on. Fall back. Hey. Fall back. Hey. My advice, there is nothing nice like the deep and fall All right, back. so this night just audition. Can I like get like a backup dance? Appeal? Listen to we are actively auditioning. And here's the interesting thing. When <laughs> Baraka Folk Singers started 11 years ago, we were initially all Jamaicans. Uh -huh. And then there was a, a mass exodus of members at our fifth anniversary. And you you know they say they say necessity is the mother of invention in jamaica we'd say um trouble take your picnic shot fit you you really i was really was forced trouble take your picnic when, when trouble take your picnic shot fit you i, I get that yes 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 so it means when you're in adversity when you're in trouble you make your hand you take your hand make fashion you really are forced to be creative and we say um, in guyana so you know when you got mommy you saw granny all right <laughs> Same thing, same thing. Yes. So, uh, for the first time, I was forced to think outside the box. Um, and folk music in 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 the Jamaican context is not really something that's it. It don't have no much appeal. It, there's there's really no no appeal to it, especially for the masses. Um, so it was hard to find new members. And for the first time, I entertained the idea of having non-Jamaican members. And I was in a musical a couple months prior to that, and I asked a friend of mine. Um, who was from New Orleans, um, a young lady that, that's from Atlanta, and a guy from the Philippines. I'd asked quite a few people, but those three people said yes. And for me, that was the turning point for Brata, excuse me, folk singers as an, as, a, as an ensemble, because those three members came in and forced us to up our game. All the members saw a, an attention to detail, um and to the craft that they had never taken before because th it's it comes inherently in, it lives in their body it's something it's been a lived experience it's something that they knew it's a part of their culture but these guys were stepping into unknown territory so they weren't leaving any t's mm -hmm. crossed or any that eyes dotted they were asking pertinent hard-hitting questions and i can't forget araba would come with her her notepad when we were doing choreography and she would say, oh no, we did five steps and then three <laughs> steps and then the last time. And I just love that. And since then, Brata has now become a multi multicultural group. We have members that are non-Jamaican, non-Caribbean, Yankee, 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 like Lori is from South Carolina, never spoke a word of Patwa. And now four years later, she's been with the group for four years. You can't talk no pattern around Lori. She can understand everything because she's become so, 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 and it's so ingrained in her. The culture has really just, just been, become a part of her. So that's the great thing. And we've, we have a Trini that's a, a permanent fixture with us. Um, one young lady that was from Antigua, she's since gone back home. She was studying at the time. She was with us, Bahamian American, Jamaican. So it's really now a multicultural group. And like you say, you know, you'll talk to Christine and some of the other members that are not Jamaican that may have had an introduction to the culture. And they'll tell you, this just sounds and feels like home because the cultures, they're, they're all so connected. Again, we're going back to the root. The root is Africa. Africa is the motherland. And we just all just happen to be dropped off at different points. And that whatever we were left with from home became something else in our various islands but the root is always going to be there so we we're, we're connected by yeah. the, the the sound of the drum and the rhythmic patterns that all are african you know but we just say yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and i hate yeah. it i mean you put a bunch of us together sometimes and we start moving you don't tell you can't tell who is from where absolutely yeah man yes yeah. yes yeah but you know what one of the takeaways that i just got from what you just said is the importance of collaboration too mm -hmm. you know because you bring in individuals from different cultures different walks of life and i think that is a critical piece in really allowing our culture to grow i really do believe that because when we bring in others who are coming from different backgrounds we're not only teaching we are also learning because yeah. it's a different it's a different space now in which to in which to exhibit a craft mm -hmm. it's a different mentality now for example you mentioned the young lady who came in with her pen and paper you know hey no last week last time we did 
five steps this, three steps that, and then one step back. Mm -hmm. You know, it forces you to really take what you have seriously. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, you you on your you goals. Confronted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, Ab we, we, absolutely. And 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 to 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 riff off your point about collaboration and working together. It's been one of the things that I've been really trying to drive, especially in the last five years, because you grew up hearing, you know, united, we stand, divided, we fall, and we have to come together and work together. And that has really been the missing ingredient for Caribbean folks, for, for people of color, especially black folks, that we find ways of working together because it's it is through collaboration that we grow in strength mm -hmm. you know but uh, but we're, we're, we've been so so focused on retaining our individual identity which i totally understand i get that you know folks don't like being called jamaican because they are they're they're trini or 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 antiguan or, or anguillan but we if we indeed came together as a as a as a as, as a region mm -hmm. i mean we would be we'd be a powerhouse you know you think of you think of the labor day parade and the impact that the labor day parade has i wish we could have something similar to similar for that for for folk performance and folk culture i hear you, know, you. i'm dreaming I'm like it out in the universe somebody would yeah. come with the idea <laughs> but my 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 vision for for folk performance is not to see it performed in in small individual spaces little pockets um but to see us come together and form a, a festival that's a weekend celebration of folk culture that is going to rival dance africa and all of these other spaces that allow for culture to be celebrated on a big scale you know and and there's no competition they're all coexisting you know in the same space so that's really my, it's part of, I, I want to say my, my life's work that I hope that, you know, one of our, even if it's not brought us, even if we were joining somebody else's, you know, vision, somebody else's event that we, we, we envision and we, we get that off the ground that we can all be like celebrating together. You know, I, I, I hear you and I'm a big dreamer like you. And that's why I really step out of the Guyanese sphere, mm -hmm. you know and go with my other brothers and sisters from different regions. And one of the things I have assessed from moving around is that there is a fear factor, mm -hmm. a fear factor that everybody wants to protect what they have, you know, That's because they work so hard for it and they don't want anybody to come and damage it and, and, and take away, you know, but we, and, and that could be cultural also yes. because the trust piece is, is we're going deep no no we're going yeah. deep right now we're gonna go down like a wormhole that's a whole other conversation yeah that's you're right it is a cultural thing about trust yeah yeah but so, like like you said part of it is that protecting it's it's protecting identity but pro protecting that thing that you work so hard for if if i can be frank for many years, I struggled with that as well. Initially, as a matter of fact, when I started Brata, you know, there were some people advising that you have to be careful who you have on your board and who you this because people will come and steal the ideas because <laughs> in their minds, it happened to them. Thankfully, you know, 11 years later, that has not happened. Um, but I can't, I, I, I would be lying if I told you that people haven't tried. You know, we certainly been tried as an organization. I've been tried as a leader, um, you know, as a director within the folk singers. But you know, when you when you're when you're sure about what you're doing, you're confident in the path you're taking. And sometimes there's some things that folks cannot deny. If it is for you, it can't be on for you. I mean, if if it be, no matter how much I try, and I tell you, I've tried for a long time to this day. It makes me uncomfortable when people introduce Brata Folk Singers and says Andrew Clark's Brata Folk Singers because I want the the organization, the entity to, to exist on its own. You know, I can always be the guy in the background. You know, it's it, it's cool if nobody knows who this phantom director is because um, I want this thing to live beyond me. But no matter what, it always comes back to me. But let me say that to you, though, as an observer, Andrew. I think part of it is the drive and the passion that you have being a member of the group, I'll put mm -hmm. it that way, is unmatched. 
Yeah. You get what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's why you always hear your name separated from the group. Mm -hmm. And for whatever it's worth, I think it's a good thing for the most part. And and don't worry about it anymore. You know that it's it's one of the things that has have made me less less fearful of of being ousted. You know, if if that happens, you know, so be it. But there'll be no denying who had started it. And I think once we get to that point as folks to be less worried about you know who's gonna steal my idea and just knowing that once you've placed your stamp on something, there's no denying it. You know, we can we can truly move forward. And I like to say too, there's so much to go around that we can all oh, Lord. up the pie. Aye, so, okay, so we're going there. We're going there. We're going there. We're going yes. there. You open the yes. can of worms. Here, yes. Here's my here's my thought about it. And I, and I don't think it's a new it's a new thought process. The challenge we have as pe people of color is that we've always lived, and again, this is this is not the view of of the program. The majority. <laughs> yeah. well, right. yes. yes, but um, I'm saying that for the viewers. This mm -hmm. is the disclaimer before I say what I have to say. But we've always struggled with not having enough as black people. Mm -hmm. You know, we we started when the race was already when the gun already fire, and we're still in the starting blocks. And unfortunately. We've consistently been, been meeting up on one roadblock after the next. And that's why we feel like the little that I have, I have to hold on to it. But people of the Caucasian per persuasion, have, it's always been there for them. You know, I think of, of being in, in the room with arts leaders that are white versus people that are, are black. And I get so much resources when I'm in a room with white people, they freely share the resources because for them, it's a dime a dozen. It doesn't take anything away from what they already have. Their pie is so huge, but unfortunately, our pie is limited. I think about funding resources mm -hmm. um, and you, 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 you can put the names of organizations that, that have been funded, whether it's local mun municipal funding agencies, um, New York or national, and very few um organizations of color are being funded and so you understand in some small way why they'd want to hold on to it but it's my view again that if the work is strong it's going to always rise to the top and it's it's it may not push your brother out of the way mm -hmm. it may push push others mm -hmm. you know non non-black organizations out of the way so i get it i get it that people feel like they have to hold on to Mm -hmm. The little that they have, because we've 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 been we've been forced to survive with so little. Well, talking about forced to survive, I want us to take a break, and in some ways, that force to survive is going to propel us into the next segment. So, mm -hmm. take a little water again, you mm -hmm. know, and I'll ask Mike to play another bit from Brata Folk Singers um, or Brata, uh, Brata Productions piece while we take a break and we'll come back and continue the discussion. I'm loving this, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mike, please take it away. Thank you. 
So you're getting a taste of Brata folk singers. And we're returning with my conversation with Andrew Clark, my brother from the arts and culture arena. You, you trot out right, Andrew? Yes, man, I'm good. Good? You good? <laughs> good, good. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time this afternoon, during this segment at least, this is Arts, Culture, and Things in Between with me, Rose October. My guest today is Andrew Clark. And I was tempted to say Andrew Barata Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are convinced Facebook. that that's my name. On Facebook, yes, because that's my name. But there's a bunch of Andrew Clarks, right? So I can understand you're throwing the brat in between mm -hmm. to really distinguish. And the, and then a friend, colleague of mine, pointed out that it's now ABC. She used to call me. She says ABC every time. Uh -huh. What does that mean? I mean, what is that? The name now is ABC. ABC. Andrew Barata <laughs> Clark. Funniest, funniest thing ever. All coincidental, yes, by the way. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So I wanted us to continue our conversation along this way. And this is going to be a little testy because it has to do with what's happening now. Mm -hmm. We're living in this pandemic, right? And you're hearing a lot of connections being made to the flu back then in 1918 and all these mm -hmm. times when we didn't even know we were going to be here. Mm -hmm. He is in you and I, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to ask you a two-pronged question in the sense that um, I'm looking at how Barata, right? How Barata has been affected by COVID-19 and in your view, how arts and culture generally mm -hmm. have been impacted by COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, so earlier, I, you had asked me how I was feeling, and I said I'm feeling better today than I was some weeks ago. It's because I'd fallen into a real deep depression because the reality of of the impact that this virus is going to have on Brata and the arts world um, really hit me. Um, you know, there is, there is, there's the very obvious, you know, isolation. People are losing their jobs. Um, we're being forced to stay home, you know, and, and isolate, quarantine to flatten the curve. Um, and, and there are some folks that they're losing their jobs, but once things return to normal, whatever that normal is, they'll regain employment. Um, and there are others that have obviously lost family members and, it, it's one of the things that I think um, hmm, we're going to be processing for a very long time because people have not been allowed, have not been given the opportunity to grieve in the way that they normally normally would. So that's a whole other thing that we have to unpack. As an, as an industry, the arts, which was, I want to say, the first to be hit when Broadway was mm -hmm. forced to shut down. Oh. The, um, and that that meant not just actors, dancers, singers, but backstage, on stage crew, lighting design. I mean, a whole cut, um, ushers at the theaters, people for concession, a slew of people lost their jobs. And because it was an unprecedented move, they didn't know how they were going to compensate these folks because it's like insurance don't really cover it. Are the actors union going to step in? Are pro producers who are not making money going to be forced to pay these actors because believe it or not actors are paid handsomely you know on on broadway mm -hmm. you know not the average actor that's out there struggling to live day to day and it's doing a you know a, a, a job as a waiter mm -hmm. um the average broadway actor gets a, i want to say two thousand dollars a week you know so it's a, ha a hefty little sum mm -hmm. you know so to ask these producers when they're not selling houses to pay the actors. It was quite the quandary. Um, so the, but the impact that that has had on Brata as, a, as an outfit is that we primarily survive on uh, funding from, from different, different institutions, be it a, a local or, or statewide or a national funder. Um, and 
because of the shutdown, we, our four senior centers were closed. The schools, obviously, are closed as well. They've moved um, programming onto, you know, Google Classroom, but I've messaged, you know, and, and been in communication with my principals, and, and one of them said, and I'm glad she wrote it in an email. She said, oh, I thought this guy was crazy when he, he wrote me because I asked, when can Brata resume our programming? Because the expectation is that um, if we've resumed classes, we can resume after school program as That's well right. because everything can can be converted into online learning experiences. But much like how society and, and we view the arts, it really is an afterthought. You know, it's like, well, we're trying to get these kids to learn science and technology and math. You know, dance classes is an afterthought. And really, it should be even more now than ever be a part of the experience because they need that escape. They're not being allowed when, when we, we can't safely play outside. Mm -hmm. um, so what better way to let off some steam and, and for mental health than, you know, to have these kids dance. But there's no space has been created, certainly not for my organization. So we stand to lose thousands of dollars of funding because we can't do any of these programs. We're thinking about Grand Market. Well, Grand Market is in December. Uh, our musical Welcome to America in March was shut down. Bankra Festival, Caribites, and the Brata Folk Singers Concert. Those are four major events, all shut down. The after school, the senior center. So I mean, thousands of dollars in funding. And you, you don't know what is going to happen in the funding world. Are they going to honor these contracts and, you know, still cut the check? And then can we still compensate our artists and find a way of doing an abridged version? How do you do an abridged version of a day-long festival that involved food and playing in the grass and families coming together and learning ring games, mm -hmm. you know, and then a live concert on stage. You can do the concert portion, but all the other elements, you can't. Um, the musical, we, we, we laid off 10 actors and a, and a, and a creative team of, of five, three musicians, close to 20 persons lost their jobs. And there's no way to create a musical in a living room because we can't create together safely as yet. Um, and then as we've, we've talked about earlier, there is no online uh, portal that allows us to be singing at the same time or even talking at the same time. So that creates a, a barrier that, that's an lim inherent limitation. So in terms of the immediate impact for Brata, it's, it's the potential loss of funding. And then, you know, there, there are these grants that are supposedly for small businesses. Unfortunately, there's there's not much space for a small, small business. Mm -hmm. You have to be a small business of a bigger size oh. to get a, a piece of the pie. You know, the, 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 um, and it's not that we don't have our ducks in a row. We, we've been in operation for, for over 10 years. We're getting funding, you know, we're being supported by public funds and, and by elected officials just like any other nonprofit, just like Lincoln Center and all these great um, and larger arts organizations. But, you know, the perimeters that they're giving sometimes just forces you out because you don't have payroll yeah. with, with, with 10 persons. You know, for a small arts organization that for the most part survives on volunteerism, we don't have staff. And that's really why we've managed to stay alive is because we've kept kept it nice and trim so we've just survived with the little that mm -hmm. that we have um the little that we do get and we create magic from virtually nothing that has that's not even an option to be able to access you know funding for 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 businesses whether it's to keep payroll or to be able to pay our or artists to, to keep the doors open and so you know a couple of weeks ago i was literally worried I was worried about the future of Brata, much like many other small organizations and then, or smaller organizations. And then I started to jump on these Zoom meetings with the other arts leaders. And I would notice in the, in the windows that I was one of, you know, maybe two or three persons of color or even the only black man on the call with, 
you know, dozens and dozens of other art, arts leaders, and they were all saying the same thing. We're worried, you know, as well. We are also worried, you know, that our organization may suffer greatly. Um, and we're, and, and they've all said that we'll suffer long after this, this, this has passed. And I said that months ago when this idea of a quarantine and isolation and the impact that this virus would have on us was, was just, we were just at the cusp of that because I remember Brata, the, the, the musical would have opened on the 28th of March. Mm -hmm. And so we had to stop rehearsals three weeks before. And back then I called the venue and I said, I think it is safe to say personally, at the time, I think Broadway had said they would have reconvened the 16th of April. Yeah. 16th of April or the 30th of April, something like that. They had envisioned kind of like a short, we're going to be locked up for two weeks and then we'll, we'll get over this. You know, it's an Ebola. It's just a, a little scare. I said to my, my co-presenter at the time, I said, I'd feel comfortable um, pushing our production to the 6th of August, the weekend of the 6th of August. So back then I was already projecting far reaching impact for Brat. And the reason I said that is because I understood and I was, was very aware of the amount of media coverage this was getting. And I thought that our, the, the, the folks that we serve, our audience would be a little more scared than everybody else to come out because for the most part, Brata's core audience are middle-aged and older, and they are the more, more uh, vulnerable population, part of the population, among the more vulnerable parts of the population. So I knew that it would have been a challenge for us if we tried to remount, you know, any time before June. It just would not have been feasible. And at the time, I still thought that we'd have been able to swing, you know, our June performances. I said, you know, just to be safe, let's push, push theater a little further back because we've always struggled, you know, to get support, especially for theater. Um, oh gosh, now two weeks, two, two months, almost three months into the lockdown. I, I am, I'm, I'm even more concerned because I feel like this, this ripple effect for the arts for an organization like Brata is going to last, it's going to last well into Christmas. And there is a talk of a possible, there's talk of a possible second and third, third wave, mm -hmm. you know, the arts, it's going to take a long time for us to recover because the arts is so, it's such a communal sort of experience. Every, every, every part, every area of the arts, when you think of, a folk singing group like Brata, we have to meet in a room together to sing and expel air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When are singers going to feel safe to sing in a room together again? You know, when are actors going to feel safe in a, in a, like, in Welcome to America, I had a love interest. We, we were in arms, we were hand in hand and hugging, you know, for most of our scenes. When will actors feel safe to do things like that? I'm thinking of dance companies that, you, you, you have a touch, you know, peer partnering. You have, so the arts, we're going to be on the back foot. We're going to be on the back foot for quite a long time. And it's, it's a scary place because so many people depend on art, whether it is as a little brat, a little bit of extra money to augment the money that they make on their nine to five, or whether it is their bread and butter. Um, to not have a space to express ourselves in 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 public anymore is 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 a scary thought. It really is a scary thought. And and beyond that, we're we're talking about this the scare for people that are creating. Even if we even if we brave the risk and say we're still going to create art, there's no guarantee the audiences will come because people are not going to feel safe for a, a while to assemble. You know, and it's going to be rough for theater, man, because we depend on every single one of those tickets, you know, I, and, and I'm talking about mid-sized to smaller organizations because, you know, the larger organizations have the, have the comfort, the cushion of, you know, um, endowments and, and mm. individual donors and corporate donors and great, I mean, 
you think of some of these 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 arts organizations oh we got we we're part of a fund and we got three hundred thousand dollars and i'm thinking gosh what would i do for ten percent of that yeah. just to be able to do a little bit of what we do um so it's gonna it's 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 gonna be an up, uphill battle, and we're being forced now in the arts world to to retool and rethink, um, and create abridged versions of what we normally do. And for me, that's been really really challenging. And I I we stayed we went dark for about a month and a half. Um, didn't put any content out on social media because at the time everybody was rushing to move everything online, and they were doing you know, various things, whether it was stage readings or, you know, concerts from living rooms. Um, it's not inherently what we do yeah. and, and what we do best. So I had to take some time away to, to assess and see if we even wanted to become a part of that virtual world because um, once you start that, you have to keep it up because it is, it is for the foreseeable future going to be the new normal until we feel safe until there's a vaccine and people feel safe to assemble in theaters um once more and and not just assemble but but assemble in the numbers that would normally be the case you know the ones that we're used to that would allow us to pay you know all our production costs um you have to be able to sustain your virtual programming so we just had to take a little bit of time to see if we wanted to put our foot in the water and if we did you know to what level we wanted to do that because I didn't want to be forced to try to be prolific online when Brat as an organization just wasn't prolific in 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 our day-to-day -day operations. We would produce one event per quarter because we knew capacity-wise that's a that's what we were able to manage. Mm -hmm. And whenever we did that, we did it well. Mm -hmm. You know, but now to move online with programming every single week, it would it would equal bur burnout. Yeah, definitely, because the people who are the artists who are involved in Barata, they still have their own lives to live and worry about. Absolutely. And, and um, as you know, I'm a board member of Ghana Cultural Association, and I couldn't help but reconnect a lot of what you're saying with the conversations we have had, mm -hmm. you know, in trying to envision a way forward. It's mm. not easy to to really revision yeah because we never anticipated this no and now that the pandemic has taken hold of our lives oh, we don't know which way to begin which way to start and in some ways i applaud the individuals who were able to move virtual to virtual absolutely uh, platform but i also see a lot of those organizations knee-jerking because mm -hmm. that's the way to go mm -hmm. and there is no forward thinking like you're saying hmm let me hold back yeah you can work you know and we at gca we're going through the same thing too because we want to make sure that we are consistent with whatever little bit we put out yeah, there man. yes you no know? because you don't want to lose quality also quality not you quality. also have to think about your your avid supporters who are there, mm -hmm. whether they're paying the five dollars at the door, the one dollar, mm -hmm. they, they're they're donating um, to keep the programs alive and all of that. You also want to be fair to them, mm -hmm. and you can be lopsided in thought so that when your production unfolds virtually, it's like, hmm, mm -hmm. this doesn't make sense. Yeah, you know. So it's it's really difficult for for the arts and culture uh, cultural. Um, activists i would like to turn performers into activists mm. right now mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we have to think of ways to stay alive and be able to advocate because yes. you mentioned a piece about funding you know grants and all of that it's like who is advocating for the small 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 man mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. organizations and for profit yes. organizations you know how did how all of a sudden small has to be qualified is it yes. tiny, small, 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 mm -hmm. you know, small, small, small? I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's like time to go Who crazy. determines these cutoff points? But yep. even outside of the realm of the arts world for funding, you know, you read these posts, these, these news articles that say, you know, that these large corporations are getting millions of dollars from this PPP 
and the payroll protection and all of these funds. And it's like, but they're not the ones that need it. Like, right. if these folks were making millions of dollars and needed a bailout, can you imagine the other small, small, the real small organizations yeah. that were yeah, asking small. their patrons for $5? Yeah. Or doing free programming and still having quality work? It's, it just, it, I'm, it boggles my mind. It yeah. boggles my mind. It's going to be hard to reel from this because I think another, th another important element of the pandemic is that people are learning how to become frugal. If you never knew how to save a penny, mm -hmm. right? All of a sudden you realize that you can save on this and you could do without stuff. Yes. You yeah. know? It's, it's, it's one of my questions that I'm going to pose. Um, you know, on Facebook, what what would we have learned from this pandemic, from this isolation, from being quarantined, from living on very little? You know, I, I, I'm hoping that employers, for example, now understand that more people can work from home. From home yeah. And you know what that means? They don't have to spend lunch money. They don't have to take the train. They don't have to drive. So that reduces pollution, that reduces congestion on the streets and in the subways. Like there's some things that are not a necessity that we forced to become, that we've accepted as being okay. And we're learning now that, like, like I've, I've been asking my friends who are working full time jobs and they're complaining that they're working more at home. Than
with Andrew Clark and Mr. Oswald Clark. My job is with Mr. Oswald Clark. So although I believe that every day should, I believe every day should be Parents Day, we know that next Sunday is a scribe, Father's Day. Father's Day. Mm -hmm. in, in your view, I would like to speak to you, you to speak to the importance of a child having a relationship with his or her father or dad or a male figure. Then speak to the relationship you have with your dad. Um, it is, it's absolutely important, just like, um, a relationship with your mother, you know, it's, it's really powerful to be able to have both parents, but I think, especially in, in, in contemporary society where we oftentimes say there is a lack of a male figure, a father figure in people's lives. Um, and in a lot of cases, it is true. Um, it's really important that we celebrate those that do exist because there are, there are a lot of good um fathers out there um you know for a young black man with all that is happening in our society uh it's important to have a father figure because that helps to give you um to help to help to define the kind of man that you are in society it helps really to really shape you and as i say that i'm thinking of my own father and the commitment that he made as a father to me and also the way i watch him navigate the world um, my father is by no means rich. You know, he, he's a landscaper. He cuts yards and cleans pools for, for a living. Um, did that for most of his life. Before that, he was working as a caddy on the golf courses in Montego Bay. Um, but he has the kindest heart. You know, daddy will, and I've seen him do it a number of times. You know, he will have a thousand dollars in his pocket which is you know a, back then it was a lot of money and if he sees somebody in the market and in his heart he feel he's he's probably known this person for many years and he he'd see them and see that they're they've they're you know going through hard times he literally just take the money out of his pocket and give them and he, and he does it without even thinking and as a child, I couldn't understand it. It used to annoy me, quite honestly, because I knew that we didn't have a lot, you know, but he, he, wasn't, he wasn't worried about giving to those that he felt needed because we would always have enough and we always had enough, you know. So it's, it's, it's seeing things like that as a, as a young man that helped to shape me because oftentimes you say, you know, there's a saying, you know, give and it will be given back to you, press down, shaken together and running over. That's my father. You know, he's he's loved, he's adored, he's well taken care of in you now in his 70s. Um, and I'm thankful for that. And that's only because of all the good that he's done um, throughout his life. Nice, nice. So let me ask you the ticklish question. What role did daddy play? in your arts life? Um, so it's interesting. Um, <laughs> but before you I, answer, let me, let me just plug this plug for Mr. Oscar Clark. Mm. I really believe you got something from him because you see that monologue he said in, that, in the street, kind of, sort of? Uh -huh, uh -huh. He, was on, he was on point. So and let me see him the that. whole New York trip. He had a monologue for everybody. And it's, it's interesting. I've never seen this side to my father. I discovered in, in spending these two or three weeks last year with him, a whole different side to him. You know, my father has always been a caregiver. He is always ensured that I've had enough, you know, more than enough, quite honestly. Um, as a child, I never grew up with him. He decided to take the decision because he was, he was so busy. And I think he probably felt like he was ill-equipped as a father to you know helped to bring me up in the way that he'd like for his son to be brought up uh so i ended board ended up boarding with uh my principal at the time i was going to unity prep school so i boarded with reverend pearl davis That's uh, in Jamaica. yes in jamaica and also went to to her church um and but daddy i never felt like i was alone and 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 i was staying with strangers because every single friday he would come to school and take me to lunch. And we'd sit and eat lunch. Well, I'd say I would sit and eat lunch because daddy wouldn't order any food. We'd go to a nice fancy restaurant. He'd order a bottle of Guinness or Malta 
and sit down and just watch watch his one son you know enjoy lunch because he said to me he never wanted me to feel like i was alone in the world because he knew what it felt like to grow up with a family that wasn't his own um but as it pertains to the arts i he he would always come to like graduations and at graduations i'd always sing or be in some dramatic production but i went to live with him at the during the maybe probably the middle of high school and that's when i got involved in a jcbc competition and he never really took notice you know i'm doing something at that time for fun when i graduate i start performing at Fairfield Theatre, Montego Bay Little Theatre Movement. And he would say, boy, I don't understand how you're going to this Fairfield business because back then you're doing theatre for the love. So I wasn't getting paid. I was leaving work at Northwest Airlines at five o'clock and headed to the theatre at six. Um, and I wouldn't be done rehearsal until 10, so I was getting home at 11. And he could not understand for the life of him, you know, why I was so committed to this thing. And I want to say maybe after my third production, he would come to the shows, was still supportive. And my third production in, I think is where he totally turned around because by then he saw that this is what I wanted to do and he was going to support me. And he would come and see that production every single night. Wow. So much so that after a few nights, the, the, the ladies at the front of house would just let him in. And they're like, yeah, Andrew, that, your daddy is here again. Because he was just coming to watch his son perform. Same show. Every night we were doing the same review. But he, he had gotten so drawn into this idea of me being an artist. Um, and when I told him I was going to Edna Manley College of the Performing Arts in Kingston, um, he was in total support of that. And since then, daddy has been one of my biggest fans, just a staunch supporter. You know, um, all the awards that I've gotten, he's, he's, he's made a shrine at home. He's building a case, a showcase. Don't ask me who that is building the showcase for, because nobody's coming to the house, but he's so proud of it. Yes. He has every newspaper clipping. Not no missing now. He's just like Team Andrew. So, um, yeah, that's how, that's how he's been a supporter of, of my pursuits in the arts. Nice, nice, nice. Well, you know, I think some of what, some of what you are doing rubbed off on him mm -hmm. because he is not bashful. Yeah, man, I think it's the other way around. I never knew daddy had talent, but he's a comedian. He can hold an audience. I mean, from the time we left, and this was daddy's first time flying, um, he was never nervous. A, a lot of people were worried for him. He was fine. By the time we got into Club Kingston, he had a crowd of ladies around him for the time he was in there. Um, and that was the case right until he left New York. He always had an audience, always telling people stuff. And I, and I looked on in amazement because I'm like, look at this little man just have all these young ladies just twirl it around his finger it was so hilarious but yeah man that is definitely a, a, a gifted artist that's where i got some of my talent from for sure there you go i'm yeah. glad that you glad that you're giving daddy props yeah man i have to give him i have to give him props he's had he's got great comedic timing <laughs> <laughs> and he's a fantastic storyteller You've done a good job chronicling it. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Man. I really admire that. So I, I admire the, the relationship you have with your dad. And I thought that this part of the program would be a way of honoring him yes. in time for next week. So I'm thinking he's going to be ecstatic when he hear this story that you've told about your relationship. But let's take a break, Andrew, and then we'll dig a little deeper into your artistic pursuits. Okay, so.
and true. Mm -hmm. Wow. You are, well, let me welcome some of our fans who might be just joining us. Thanks for joining us. If you're just joining, I'm Rose October, you with arts, culture, and things in between. I'm sitting with my guest today, Andrew Clark, who hails from Jamaica, from the yard. <laughs> yard, yard, yard in the yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Andrew, you are a multi-talented artist. I mentioned earlier that you sing, you organize, you produce, you MC, you act. I know you do a little bit of dancing. It went put a, to the test. A mover, yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm a mover. <laughs> well, let's focus a bit on Andrew, the producer. Mm -hmm. The clip we just saw was uh, from a show uh, that you produced, Welcome to America. And I know the backdrop is that of an immigrant story, but let me ask you, what are some reasons for this production, especially with the title of it? Mm -hmm. um, doo -doo -doo. I, I want to say that at the time, it was, it was a story that was, was begging to be told. Um, we brought a production has been around for now 11 years. At the time, we were uh, six going into seven years of operations. And our mission has always been about telling Caribbean stories and not just telling Caribbean stories, but telling Caribbean stories um, by Caribbean writers and with Caribbean artists. Um, and part of the reason I started Brata was because I had come to New York with, you know, big dreams of making it on Broadway, seeing my name in bright lights, you know, on the great white way. And after a year or two, I quickly discovered how challenging it would actually be, you know, to make it on Broadway. And now, 10 years later, I realize that it's even more challenging than I thought then because, you know, there, there are so many layers to, to making it in the, in the industry. One of the most recent um, things that has come to the fore is the lack of diversity on Broadway. You know, so never mind that I have a thick Jamaican accent and... Um, I don't uh, have a union card, then we're, 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 we're left with the lack of black roles, roles for black actors. So, you know, you go to an audition as a, as a, as a black man and you're competing for the, two, the one token role and there are 200 of us, you know, everybody equally talented, can sing, dance, act, play an instrument, juggle balls, and we're tussling for this one role. So. We Brata needed Brata needed to happen so that we could create space for artists like myself to showcase their talents and not have to be pounding the pavement all the time, chasing this sometimes elusive dream of being on Broadway. So Welcome to America came about because we also needed a musical. You know, Broadway is about the musical and and, and we've had musicals that have claimed to be Caribbean and, and they, they do have you know, they have a Caribbean treatment for all intents and purposes. But most times the creative team and the artists aren't Caribbean. Um, they make no attempt to be authentically Caribbean in, in, in accent or sometimes anything else. Um, so it's sometimes Caribbean just in name only. Welcome to America is, is Caribbean in the story that it, te it tells or the, the writer of the book, Carla Bryan Williams, who is brought as artistic director, is Jamaican. The, the musical team, myself and Joel, who um, write the lyrics and compose the music, we're both Jamaican, and our director, our current director for the production, Chris Walker of the National Dance, for, formerly of the National Dance Theatre Company of Jamaica, fantastic choreographer, is now uh, acting as director and choreographer. Um, and then the artists that we, we hire for the production, they're they're for the most part Caribbean and Caribbean American. And of course our focus is on really telling an authentic story, something that tells our story from our perspective that we can control the narrative. Nothing needs to be watered down um, for, for it to be commercially viable. What's the backdrop? What's the backdrop story? So it's in short, it is, it is a story about a young lady, Sabrina Barnes that leaves Jamaica with, um, she studied at Enda Manley and she leaves Jamaica with the, with the intention of, you know, being on Broadway. 
um, no, the story is not about me, but it's a common story. So many of us as artists, as immigrant artists um, from different places come to New York with the hopes of making it on Broadway. Uh, but unfortunately, she's undocumented. Um, and so, you know, everything else that follows, you know, the stories are so similar. You come here, you're undocumented, you have to get a, a work under the table. Some people try to get, get married. The, the, you know, the marriage route does not always work out. Sometimes we end up in abusive relationships um, or encounters with family. Sometimes change how we perceive the city. Because you come sometimes with hopes of spending time with auntie or cousin so-and-so, but they've become a different person, you know, because New York invariably demands that you become a different person in some almost hard you know because you have to pay rent so the first the first time she she comes in you know her aunt says you have to get to work this is not a it's not a vacation you know you have to help pay some bills in here so that really is the backdrop of welcome to america and we just watch her as she she tries as a as a jamaican as an immigrant um as an artist to navigate the world i think certainly the the, the story is is a unique one in that there's the artist angle because we don't oftentimes hear the struggle of the artist. You know, we hear the general immigrant experience, but our immigrant artists have a very specific challenge. You know, the visas that we have to get um, in order to just work and the cost of those visas. Um, so that's really what, what sets, you know, Welcome to America as a story apart. You know, for the artists too, um, especially coming and hoping to land it big, mm -hmm. there's also that period of feeling disillusioned, you know, and many artists end up doing something else as their real job. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and they end up doing their craft on the side. It's not too many lucky ones, mm -hmm. especially those who are with the brown. Yes. Color. Yeah. Oh, um, skin color and and it's it's just harsh and it doesn't even mean that you're not the best at what you do. It just means that it's difficult for you to get a break. Yeah. So, yeah, man, it's it's a matter of access, you know. Um there's there's the obstacle of, of being a, a, a union actor that sometimes gets you in the room quicker. Um, if you have an agent, if you have a manager, that's another, you know, way of getting in. And oftentimes, you know, casting directors will call in actors that they've worked with before. So again, if you're not in that circle through whatever means, you know, whether it's, you know, through your, your equity card, having an agent manager, or having been in a production previously that a casting director can now vouch for you, um, it makes it difficult to make it in. So that big break sometimes is is very, very el elusive and you be become disillusioned as an actor and you say, listen, I need a survival job because you have to pay rent. Yeah. So again, we push, the, the thing that we came here for gets pushed to the side. Hence, another reason why projects like, and I say projects because I've seen Welcome to America and I really think it, it needs a tour. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that if there's anybody watching and listening to us, the, you know, who wants to be a really good philanthropist, mm -hmm. who can put this, this uh, project out in the world, that would be a great, great thing. Um, let's take a break, Andrew, and we'll come back and talk some more. All right. Do More in the land of virtual, 
<laughs> you, you heard some action in the back end there. We were supposed <laughs> to have a video, but we can live with that. Tell us what we heard there. You were in a play. Yes, yes. It's a play called A Man Like You. Okay. Um, written by a, a Kenyan writer about the um about some Somalian pirates. Uh so I was gosh, I was You were a pirate? Yes, I was a Somalian pirate. Okay. Gosh, what is the language? I don't think it's Somali. I may have been speaking Somali, but I actually, I had very few lines in the show, um, but I had to speak in an authentic accent um, and in the language, which was an interesting challenge for me. And again, not having many lines, you know, really depends on your, your talent as an, as an actor um, and the choices that you make. But that was a very interesting one. It was, it was set on, on a backdrop of, of us kidnapping um, and holding hostage uh, a white diplomat and we were bouncing between him being held captive and his torture essentially and the experience of his wife back home in in London so mm -hmm. very 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 different sort of production for me yeah playing now, the villain almost now there's another I, I want us to show this one this is funny let's take another quick break I want us to show the comedic piece and then we'll come back and talk a little more about your acting. Okay. All right. So let's watch the comedian. Let's watch the comedian. Oh. We have visual now. We have visual now. Oh, no. I have a little matter for bring to me. Me get a banana bread, a cola banana bread from a friend of mine, Andrea. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the banana bread. So. Me come home and me cut a nice little sliver, a diet slice. And I enjoy it and me put on the rest. Please note, me only cut a sliver, nothing more. Me put on the rest because me want it for last. This man will wake up and say, me I will take another slice. This is what we find. Half a banana bread. This was just missing a slice, a sliver, a diet slice when me left it yesterday and when the banana bread disappear go now this is when me start to understand all of them people here were complaining about the fact that in the quarantine then food dis disappear hey, I don't understand and whoever I go around and yam people food me I said for you know who know better watch out God, this is a real terrible hack. You mean to tell me so the food that disappear right under my own nose? My food not safe in my house tomorrow? I want the government to come talk to you. I need them to go and check her last food report. Because this banana bread no beach no safe. Tell me one in here. Nobody not going and coming. So who near me door? Hmm? Who don't tell me now? What? I they check for them. I they check for them. I they watch and pray over it. It now good also. For all of you people that are also suffering from this scourge of disappearing food during the quarantine, I they pray we don't know. We need to start a support group because this is a scourge and it now good also. Now good on track. Oh my goodness, <laughs> Andrew, the banana bread, <laughs> banana bread, no, please tell me that you got the banana bread baked here and it didn't come from Jamaica. No, it didn't come from Jamaica. Oh. A, a friend of mine that, that lives close by, okay. she, she, she decided to gift me with a whole, a whole banana bread. And I guess you can help yourself. You can help. Um, bad idea. Bad idea. When you're locked up in quarantine, what else do you do but eat and watch yes. TV and sleep? Yes. <laughs> so, let me ask you. I mean, to me, it would appear so your acting has no boundaries. I mean, you could do the comedic thing. You could do the serious thing. You could do the singing thing. You know, you can do so many things with your acting expertise. How did you get into acting? Do you remember the first play you did? 
I think I remember the first play I did. It was either... I'm going to have to check. It's a cross between a play in, in school uh, directed by Tony Rodney. He was the drama teacher at, in prep school. And we did a play about HIV. Okay. So it's either that production or I was a part of a cantata with Vivine um, Decoro. And she was a musical director at our church. And I would have played you know, one of the juvenile leads in, in one of the Easter productions. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are my first memories of, of being an actor. Of an do, you, do you remember any, any lines from back then? No, sir. Eh -eh. I don't remember any lines <laughs> from then. But, but one thing I remember, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it 20, <clears throat> 20 years later, um, I remember there was a young man that we were we were gunning for the same role the hiv role and i ended up getting it and he was so mad and i thought about it a few months ago and i was like well you know i would like to call that young man i will apologize to him i was searching on facebook for him because i was like i'm wondering if he ended up pursuing the arts like myself because I mean, back then we were just so passionate about what we were doing, and it. I think what it underscores is how how things happened. Things are important in a moment, and you know, years later you can look back and say, "Really, that's what I was fighting about." Like it really wasn't that serious, but at the time for us, yes, back then you know we were eleven, ten, eleven years old. It meant everything to us. Okay, so fast forward now and through the adult. To date, what has been your favorite, your most favorite mm -hmm. acting role? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, there are a couple scripts that always keep handy. Um, and I did a production called uh, Roaring Se Roar 70s uh, a few years ago. Yep. And yes, you were stage manager on that show. That's how we met. And yes. I was playing Geddes Granger, who is a, 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 a freedom fighter, a, a civil rights leader of sort uh, from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, you know, so I had to attempt the Trinidad accent, which again is another thing that is, is touchy because we know that all the accents are so different. You know, yep. but everybody thinks Caribbean accents are Jamaican. So I ensured as much as I could. Um, that I was able to capture that accent. But I remember that being a really pivotal role for me because I learned so much about what, what um, freedom fighters of that era in the 70s were doing right across the Caribbean, really, you know, and, and how music was being used as, a, as a, a mode of resistance and speaking out so much of the music um, from that. You know, you think of Calypso, you think of, you know, you want to dance and sing, but during the seventies, it was music of resistance. Do you remember? The, do you remember any of the songs? Um, I remember Trinidad is my land, and of it I am proud and glad. But I can't understand why some people just talk it bad. All of them who run in them out. Don't know what they talking about. They could paint here black every day. And the writing they will never say. Like our sportsmen, we in rated among the best. Our scholars have sat and passed every test. And put us right alongside the rest. Oh, our pitch lakes, which is greatest one of its kind. Our sugar and oil is really refined. So you see, friend, this is a real King Solomon's mind. <laughs> <laughs> you really, you really make me have to scratch my brain for that one day. I was like, it's been years. That was, that was when? Was that like 2016? I can't remember. It's, it was, it's been quite a while. It's, I, I'm thinking maybe 2015 even, but it, Right, yes, because Welcome to America was 2017. And I, it would have been about two or three years prior that we'd done yeah, the production. Yeah. But hey, that was good, man. I saw, <laughs> I saw the eyes doing the number, like bring yeah. it. Bring the memory back. Bring the memory back. Yes. That was good. Um, do you remember any favorite lines from plays, though? 
I mean, to show your range? Um, I, I think I would go back to, there's a, there's a production I did right after that called Flambo. Mm -hmm. um, another Trinidadian production really and, key. and um there there's a particular line the, the the backstory of that is is flambo you know a flame being used as again resistance um to the to the against being enslaved about against the slave masters you know Trinidadians fighting for their independence and the character that I played in the remount breeze, um, he says, uh, I see broken bones that once had souls. Three, three dead men swelling like dogs in the heat. Two young, strong men who find it too late that police ain't fight fear. Boom from a distance then bam the bodies hit the dirt that is not the way big city and <laughs> when i think about those lines i think about what is happening now those lines resonate so much with me because you know 450 years later not much has changed you know Police who are sworn to serve and protect are still sometimes our greatest danger, you know, and we see that in, in as recent as two nights ago, a gentleman sleeping in his car, intoxicated or not, he's running away, not presenting a danger, as far as I'm concerned, you know, if you're running away, you don't have a weapon, and they choose to take his life because to them it appears like we are we're not we're worthless you know a few and just a few weeks ago we're this is now on the heels of weeks of protests um against the killing of george floyd brianna taylor unrelated not by police but ahmed ahmad you know and so many others before them and just to, to think that two days ago something something similar happened it's just I, i'm not quite sure how to process it so it was just interesting that this production that was speaking about a time more than 400 years ago yeah is still relevant today the very lines are relevant today because for for um eight 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 minutes 46 seconds eight minutes, yeah. there, you know Nine just at absolute disregard for for human life yeah yeah, yeah. So you think if there was a recap of Flambo now, it would be timely? Oh my gosh, absolutely it would be in so many ways. You know, there is there the, because there is a revolution happening. Yeah. You know, we are we are uh, to borrow the, the lyrics from a Beres Hammond song. We're putting up resistance because we've grown tired, and 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 even well-thinking white people are becoming allies because they're recognizing. You know, whether it's late, late or not, welcome to the party. Thank you for acknowledging it. You know, whether it's through guilt or just being a genuine ally, they're recognizing that the system is 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 skewed. There's something wrong. We're flawed. You know, and it, and and whether the whether the the the, the um, semantics of defunding the police. You know, whether that is the right phrase to use, we understand that the intention is that the resources are not being put in the right place and we can we can spread them to other places, mental health and social services, because we've clearly the, the, the military stance has not has not proven to be, you know, very effective. Yep. Yeah. Difficult times then. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I I watched not not to not to not to cut you, but I watched a video just today. Um, a white officer comes out of her cruiser um, and approaches a little a little girl. I think she says she's thirteen, and the little girl is shaking and crying because she's afraid of the police officer. And the lady kneels down and she says, "I have a daughter your age. 
you know, not all of us are bad. No need to be afraid. And even when she said that, the little girl was just still shaking like a leaf and crying because... The trauma. The trauma that everybody yeah. has felt and is feeling. Yeah, man. And I tell a, a, a good friend of mine sent me um, in, in, in Facebook Messenger um this this news item about whenever you're pulled over the iphone has an has a feature that you say siri i'm being pulled over and siri will start recording the encounter and i said to her i said okay i i don't even remember that in those moments because now every time i pass a police car i i'm i'm anxious yeah not doing anything wrong i'm not speeding i have my seat belt on not using my my cell phone haven't committed a crime but just hearing police sirens or seeing a police cop yeah. car pass, it just puts me on edge. And it's it's really unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, okay. man. Yeah. So let's take a break and come back. I like how you were able to tie in Flambo with what's going on today because it really shows how We still have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. Yeah, man. It shows how theater can bring some kind of awareness and healing. Mm -hmm. And I really, truly believe that when we come out of this, you know, flambeau should be reawakened. Yeah. Because it can be viewed from a set of different lenses now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Given. Yeah our recent incidents of um, murders of black men by police officers. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a break, Andrew. Positive pulsating poetry inspired by a passion for that which must be fulfilled. Gina Dina, Rosita, Clementina, round the corner posing. Let your life be something they sell it. When you catch them broke, you could get them all for nothing. Don't make a row. Yankees gone and Sparrow take over now. You have to put the coal on the inside. You light it and you close it and you iron all day long this was the famous kitchen bitch it's a, actually a condensed milk can for all you polished you know caribbean people out there that a zinc man you call mr tinny would kindly make you a lantern that you use in the kitchen Long time I be shop a store, no we do the shop online. This time a long time, this time a long time, this not the before time. <laughs> Have a doubt, so she did have a son. The lift doesn't work, run up the stairs and the come. Cause if you don't come, we cannot gonna see your sons of a cup. A bunch of rows and I started to run. Here and have mercy on a good man and help him. We pray, Jama. Oh, 
you to know that I am the man who fight for the right, not for the wrong. Andrew, mm -hmm. you should be smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that. I am my my most, I'm I'm my harshest critic. You know, so this the, the though the show was a triumph, as you said, there were the technical glitches, and it's like, gosh, we can be better, we can be better, because I I hold myself to high standards, but I also believe that as cultural artists, we we are held to 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 very low standards, you know, oftentimes by the public. And so we have to outperform, you know, popular forms to really gain equal notoriety. So that's why I'm always very, very adamant about, you know, just everything being near perfect. So, so a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, you've taken on this feat of what I determined to be a massive production and in organizing artists from the Caribbean region. And I was thinking that COVID-19 with all of its negative impacts mm -hmm. allowed for something good to come out of it. And please folks who are watching, don't take this the wrong way. I mean that with the isolation mm -hmm of individuals in different parts of the world because it's a pandemic, you were able to actually go into the Caribbean regions yeah. and pull this together that you have been trying to do on the ground mm -hmm. for yeah. years. Yeah. And I thought this is going to be grand once we were talking and I heard what you were doing and where you were going and all of that good stuff. So I know that you along with, I'm going to claim him right now, and I know you claim him too. So I'll say my first and then our uh -huh. knowledgeable, uh -huh. talented, and generous technical engineer, Mr. Rawl De Silva. If you don't know him, people, you know him now of, uh, of RDE Pros. He, he, I mean, he just unfolded this unquestionably high and production. I know that there were two others um, who were working along with him. Mm -hmm. And I think what you all have done is given us an opportunity to brag as yeah. Caribbean people. Mm -hmm. with, with, and folks, what I'm talking about here is the, the Banco Caribbean Culture Fest Festival. We just saw snippets of it. And I'm sorry for those of you who, who missed it, but a lot of different things were happening at the so same time. It's, it's, still on our, it's still on our Facebook page. The okay, full, right. the full so event, it's that. five okay. hours, 11 minutes. So you, you have to get your, your, your coffee and your, and, your, and your popcorn, <laughs> but it's still, it's gonna remain um, on, our, on our Facebook page, Brad sure. Productions, um, so that people can, can enjoy it at any time. So tell us how you managed to execute this production? Oh gosh, I mean, in hindsight, I was crazy to even envision this, you know, because it was, it was our first time going virtual, doing anything digitally. Um, most times, all our productions are live. We very rarely, I don't think we've ever broadcast anything. We've had recordings of almost every production we've done, um, and it's just been for archival purposes. So for us to be taking on a multi-platform, um, mo something that was happening over a, sea, a, a few, four hours, five hours, it's, it was just a mammoth of a task. It was really ambitious because we were broadcasting from our, from our website and then streaming to YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, which has its own inherent challenges. And then also bringing in performances from elsewhere. So, you know, the health panel was happening in New York, um, or art and craft was in another space in New York. All those ladies on the health panel were in different places, you know, so at any time, you know, people's internet could have gone bad. Same thing for the art and craft. Then we had storytelling coming in from LA with Califest. Uh, and then we had a Zoom room with multiple 
art uh, multiple vendors and then all our performers from the different islands. So there was our, our MC live from, from Jamaica and there's Dominica, Trinidad, Guyana, Jamaica again. I'm, I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it was very, very ambitious really to be doing that much. A friend of mine, a, a colleague, um, called me and said, boy, I'm, I'm really not blowing smoke up your ass, Andrew, but it is, th this production was, was, was top notch. It felt like I was watching a, a telethon, you know, a, and that for me was, was really, was really humbling. That was, that was a huge compliment. Well, I'm wondering how you're going to top that. That, no, that's the challenge. That is the challenge because when you set the bar that high, you have to stay at that level. So we have another production coming up in two weeks, which initially we had only planned to do one production per, per month. So we were going to do something in June, in July and August. But based on the funders, because Brata is a nonprofit, um, the funders stipulate that the, the funds have to be used by the end of June. And we only got that notice three days ago. All right. So hold, hold on that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to Bankrupt, mm -hmm. um, the, the Culture Festival. There, how, how was it for you reaching out to the different artists in the different parts of the world, literally? Mm -hmm. how, how were you able to do that? Well, some of them came from personal relationships. So like Marva, for example, Marva Newton, we'd worked on Roaring 70s That's together right. for the first time. And... Since those many years, I said to her, I said, Marva, we're going to work together. I'm sure she didn't believe me. She was just like, oh, yeah, another friend said we're going to work together. But, you know, six years later or so, we were happy. She was happy to be coming on board. And all of that, we were already planning from early in the year, pre-COVID, to actually have her fly up to New York to perform live. So that was already in the works. Um, Dee Burns came through a connection with our musical director. He was also supposed to be coming, um, you know, up from Jamaica. And all the other artists are were, were either the Domin Dominican, Dominican, sorry, um, poet, uh, Rasmo Moses. I had put a call out on Facebook asking for cultural artists. And some people just tagged a few people from the different islands that I could connect with. And he's one of the folks that was suggested and he responded and you know the rest is history he was he was part of the brata family what difficulties you experienced in putting this together um the the lack of experience really you don't it's a platform that you're not familiar with working with you know theater is inherently live and in the moment it happens and you can never fix it you know, even for a live concert, it's the same. You you program your instruments, you you program your your software, your mic check, you 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 check all your instruments, your sound input and output, and hope that when the show goes live, everything runs great. Um, with this platform, with a digital platform, as we've seen even from this this uh, program, anything can happen. You know, the software that you're you're broadcasting with can crash. The internet that um, that some one of your performers is using may not be strong enough. You may have bandwidth issues. Um, a number of things can happen, and it it is a very scary space to work in because our audience is not always forgiving. They're not understanding. They expect the same quality, the same sort of output from you when you're working in a platform that we're just all figuring this out. I think you know. Even Zoom, this whole idea of working on Zoom, folks have been doing this for the better part of two or three months, and we're still learning. We're still forgetting to unmute our microphones. Okay. Or we've, we've seen those videos of people supposedly ending phone calls and, and getting up and exposing themselves because we're not, it's not a space that we're used to working in. Um, so we'd hope that people are a little bit more understanding, you know, that we are striving for perfection but invariably, you know, things happen that are most times just out of our control. In terms of preparing, mm -hmm. could you nail a, a time factor, the limit um, that you've spent? What amount of time did you spend preparing for this? Gosh, it was at least 
I want to say a month and many, many hours of work because there are, there are the emails back and forth because everybody's literally in the islands. They're in different places. You know, to make it more cost efficient, you're not on the telephone calling everybody. Um, so you're sending out emails and hoping that people respond in a timely manner. And if they don't, you have to send many follow-up emails. And sometimes you have to do a WhatsApp call if you have their contact information. And even then, um, the different islands were in varying states of lockdown. So some people had regular life still going on during the day. So they wouldn't be able to respond um, when you'd like to get the information. Um, so there was, there was that challenge, but lots of planning, lots of planning. I think certainly much less than if we were doing a live show because they're obviously much less, um, uh, much less moving parts, but equally challenging. Do you think you will do it again virtually, even when the uh, pause have been lifted? Let's say fast forward next year. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's an interesting thought. I think what would be challenging is because the live edition has many moving parts and they're sometimes happening simultaneously. So we, I guess we would have to figure out what takes, what gets the focus and what takes precedence because we'd be starting with a drum circle and while um, drum circle is happening, there's basket weaving and vendors are still selling their items and we may have you know, kids playing in the, in, the, in the play zone and we have games and, and, and competitions, friendly games and competitions happening on the field. So a multiplicity of things may be happening all at the same time, but it would be interesting to certainly um, live stream it because I can say one of the good things that have, has come out of this um, incarnation is that we've, we've gotten more, more engagement and more views than we would have ever even gotten had this been an in-person sort of experience because on, we were broadcasting on four different platforms and just on our Bangkok Caribbean Culture Festival page, because we have a fan page for the festival, um, we had over 4,600 views, you know, and so much engagement and that didn't include, you know, all the other platforms. We wouldn't have gotten 4,000 patrons. Yeah. You know? if the show was being held live. So in terms of reach, it has certainly given us greater access. Um, so yeah, I would, I would certainly entertain the idea of going digital. The other thing I'm thinking, Andrew, is that doing, doing this as a physical performance, I'm saying physical so people will understand it, the difference between broadcasting live, mm -hmm. right, that we're in, and the physical performance. Um, I'm thinking that Sometimes when you're planning the physical performances, people from different parts of the region would say, yes, artists would say, yes, they'll come, they'll come, they'll come. Mm -hmm. And they show time, they're missing. Or a couple of days before, you can't get to them or something happens. Yes, right? yes. And then before you know it, the program becomes heavy and lopsided with a particular genre or a particular style or a particular something, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're frustrated, you're disappointed because you didn't get it the way you wanted it. Yeah. But here in virtual land, you are kind of sort of able to realize this dream. That's, that's true. I can say, and, and it's interesting you mentioned that you're absolutely right that had this been a live performance, the concert would not have been a, as seamless as it, as it was because invariably somebody gets stuck in traffic and we are now scrambling to let the MC know that even though this has been scripted and timed out a particular way, we've got to work on this on the fly. I mean, last year, I remember Joan Andrea Hutchinson was our MC and we had a snag and she just said to, she said to Carl, who was, you know, the production manager for the stage at the time, she says, just get me two CD and two T-shirt. And she started something on the fly to, to make up time until we were able to, you know, get our artist in place. But yeah, you're absolutely right, man. This, the live presentation and the in-person um, and, and the virtual space is, they're, they're two totally different mediums and they're, there are certainly pros and cons to both of them. Yep, 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 yep. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing is, and I guess you understand what the MC did. 
because you've done and see am seeing yourself mm -hmm, mm -hmm, part mm -hmm. of what you do but as a producer you can't even you're thinking you have an mc the mc better work it yeah make some magic happen i don't care what yes you know, yeah. turn the stars green i don't care mm -hmm. you know make it work and and that's also very important in doing the um the live performance but let me ask you the in person the physical performances mm -hmm. let me ask you a lot how you would share some thoughts given that you have done this thoughts ideas knowledge you've done this many non-for-profit organizations are going virtual they have to mm -hmm. you know what's going on funding is there the carrot is there mm -hmm. you gotta grab it right although the funders understand that there are some difficulties in actualizing programs, uh, uh, operationalizing programs. They still expect to, to get a program with some kind of quality. Mm -hmm. For those individuals who are venturing into si the, simil the similar platforms with performance-like shows, what would you say to them in terms of making it easier for them to execute? um plan 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 when you have and when i say plan 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 i mean plan in advance but plan for almost anything to happen have a plan a b and c because a, a perfect example for us we thought of the possibility of delays between broadcasts and we say if that happens brawl this is what we're going to play we're going to play so we're never going to have to sign off and say you know, there's that we will we will always have some sort of content to fill those gaps until we can get the MC back up to speed, until we can get the broadcast, the live performances happening, you know, in a timely fashion. So that that would be one of my one of my biggest um, pieces of advice is prepare for the inevitable, prepare for the unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, and in so doing, you won't be caught, you know, you know, with your pants down and really just scrambling because it is a scramble oftentimes because you then now have to jump on the phone and say what's going on because sometimes you know talking using your production software is not the most efficient right. and it, it it it's nerve-wracking it can be nerve-wracking yep 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 well i am waiting to see how you're gonna top this next year uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure no pressure not at all. all not at all let's take a break <laughs> let's take a break andrew all right, and we'll come back. Excuse me. sitting with my guest today, Andrew Clark, on arts, culture, and things in between. Andrew is also the executive and 
executive director and founder of Barata Productions. And Barata Productions has three prongs, right? Barata folk singers that we just saw, which I want us to talk about a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then there is the uh, theater workshop, right? And then there's an educational piece to it, mm -hmm. third piece. Now, I always enjoy Barata folk singers because not just because of not just the spectacle of the colors, the, the, the bright, the bright colors of the costume, but also the movement, the choreography, very animated, you know, a little bit of acting comes in. Mm -hmm. And in a minute or two, you could throw in a little step. Somebody might be doing a little jig someplace. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy watching and hearing Branta because the element of keeping folk culture alive is present. Mm -hmm. What is the reason or what are some reasons that you mostly do, if not only do, folk songs with Barata, folk singers? So um, it was important for us to, to highlight that part of our culture because in a lot of ways, especially in contemporary society, it's being forgotten, it's being lost, you know, not being performed, not being preserved. You, you ask the average child, I think in, in Jamaica, aside from those that may be a part of the, the JCBC annual competitions every year, so they learn it through their schools. That's what JCBC is. Jamaica Cultural Development Commission. Okay. And they have an annual festival of the performing arts where schools, colleges are involved um, community centers as well, community groups, and they compete at the at the parish, the local, very very local level. So they go parish, then regional, and then they compete at the national awards for you know gold, silver, bronze, national awards, and um, there are various uh, genres that they compete in. Um, so there's there's drama, music, visual arts, speech, uh, and dance. And within those, they have the folk form. So dance has a, a lot of folk categories. And that's what's allowed a lot of these traditions to be passed on to the younger generation because in, in ordinary society, it's not, it's not done, you know? So the average child doesn't know who Miss Lou is. They don't know any folk songs apart from maybe Evening Time and Linstead Market. You know, they don't what know market? any, pardon me? What market? Linstead Market. I'll ask you to sing that because I don't know it, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the folk singers sang it as part of their set for Bankra. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you ask them about a, a Jamaican proverb or a riddle. You know, they, they don't know those things, you know, so our, our, our traditional culture is, is being eroded, you know, it's being overshadowed by popular forms and it's not a competition, you know, it's just unfortunate that both have not been allowed to exist in the same space. And it's nothing new. Um, it's the case when, when, when the times change and the genres change. I, I remember um, I watched a, a, a short documentary um, with, uh, oh my God, Della Reese recently and she said, that the music she used to sing when she was singing in 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 the pop world by the time the 70s or 80s came around she she felt like she would she would be obsolete because they weren't singing yeah. you know jazz and standards anymore it's it, it had become a different form and she never felt like she had a place so it's pretty mm -hmm. common for for it to happen that whenever popular forms take hold the form that existed before kind of gets shoved to the side. And that's really why Brata Folk Singer ex exists, to just keep that tradition alive, you know, to you pay know, homage to our, our parents, the cultures of our parents and grandparents. So true. We have the same thing in Guyana, you know, and it's so hard to get the young people mm -hmm. to pay attention to that because, it, like you said, it's a different time. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. trend is different. So... There, there, there need there. There is a need for gatekeepers, yes, for culture to be there, and and drag them along literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people 
I feel I feel out of place sometimes because when they hear Brata folk singers, they're convinced it's a group of old people and the director must be old and geriatric. And then see me and they go, um, you're the director. How how what's your connection to folk music? I couldn't tell you quite honestly because it's int- I grew up in a in a in a middle class family, and I'm saying that as a family I board I, I used to board with. Um, I don't recall them singing folk songs or 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 you know celebrating folk life. We lived in a middle class neighborhood. I never went to river, never used to be it outside. You know, none of these things. But I've grown to love them, and that's why I. I believe in in the spirit of our ancestors living on in, inside of us because my love for folk music and folk culture was just really innate that I've always been drawn to it. I've always loved Miss Lou for as long as I can remember. You know, cried when 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 they were having her funeral and me couldn't go, you know, and pay my respects because I was in, in Montego Bay. Um, so yeah, it's it's really, really uh it's gosh it's such important work and it's really difficult as you've said to to engage younger folks because pop music is is all the rage but you know it's difficult to engage younger folks there there for us meaning our home country Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. much less here can you imagine Yeah. yeah 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 you know so it's really the work that Barata folk singers or Barata productions is doing with respect to keeping the culture alive is as admirable as the work of, of Guyana Cultural Association because we do similar work in really mm-hmm. preserving rather um, and propagating and all of that promoting our culture here mm-hmm. in a foreign in a foreign country and it's not easy and. I, I think this is the place where I need to put a plug in mm. that our organizations really need your support. You know, we really need your support, not just the monetary aspect, but be, to be able to push it and talk about the importance of this is how we really get cultural identity. Folks don't understand that, that, you know, it's not just we putting out a flag and waving it. Yeah. It's being able to talk about your heritage about your cultural traditions with some conviction you know that you embrace it with pride and this is who you are and so what you know what i mean yeah. so i am i'm really um thankful for the work that you are doing and and we at Ghana cultural association uh, that we are doing there too i want to ask you though about the theater workshop talk mm-hmm. a little bit about the theater workshop piece of brata so initially when we started it's funny because most people know when they hear brata they think brata folk singers immediately because that has become our flagship program but Mm -hmm. we actually started with theater our first production our first few productions before we even started the folk singers were um was to uh produce stage readings and those stage readings evolved into main stage productions and of course they started with jamaican writers because that's where our our access was you know we had access to all of these writers and directors from jamaica so we started to produce their work first um and that evolved from from stage readings into full main stage productions we don't do theater as much as we would like because um there's the inherent challenge of the the we're we're underfunded in in the theater theatrical space and even our patrons don't support us as much as we'd like. So they will they will see a visiting production from Jamaica and spend, you know, 40, 60, 50, 60 dollars to go see it, but they won't come to a Brata theater presentation for $25, you know? Uh, folks asking, you know, no cheaper ticket. And it's like, no, you know, the costs are what they are, you know? Just like people complain about the the, 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 the cost of rent in New York City, renting theatrical space is also expensive. And if you want a great production and high production values, we have to invest in it. We have to pay for our set and our costumes and we have to pay trained actors, you know, experienced actors. So if you want a high quality product, you really have to pay for it. And $25, you know, in 2020 is bottom of the barrel, you know, quite honestly. 
for live live entertainment. Yeah. And the other thing is too, like like some performers who would say they would come through to do the Bankra mm -hmm. Caribbean um, Culture Festival. Some page some quote unquote patrons would say they can't wait for your next production. But then when the production happens, they're not coming out. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I have so many stories. Don't get me started. Um, from the folks that RSVP on Facebook and you see, you see, you know, they say 250 people are going to come on it, maybe one show only. And you look in the theater and it's like 50 people. And I know things happen. Life happens. You know, people have deaths in their family. Somebody may have met in a car accident days prior. They fell ill. But what are the odds of three quarters of the people that said they were going to come not show up to the theater? Yeah, and you are absolutely right. I remember the days when the folk singers used to do full concerts every June. We did it for three years and then I stopped. Um, got wiser because back then we never used to do it with any funding. So we were, we were working like workhorses, rehearsing from January through June and doing one or two shows and getting, you know, a, a reasonable sized audience, but not anything to really pay the bills. Because back then the singers weren't being paid. So all our expenses, all our car, the money went back into just beer minimum, the, covering the expenses of the production. And um, singers would say to me, you know, individual singers would say, oh, so-and-so said, well, to go bring back a production. And I'm like, you know, as much as we'd like to do a show every few months, the amount of work that goes into it and you know it as a performer but also the audience you know one or two of our friends don't pay the bills yeah. you know we theater needs numbers you know it's not two thousand people two two dozen people you know that pay pay for a production it takes a lot of money and so you're absolutely right man we need that physical support we need butts in the seats bodies in the space you know to help you know, that's, that's, like, that's a parallel to the trend that we were talking about with the children and all of that. I think um, with, with that, I, I believe that we need to continuously educate those who propose to support us mm -hmm. that they need to follow through. Yeah. Because it's very, it's not encouraging for artists to be rehearsing for lengthy periods and then they come to the performance space the performance date and you look out it's like really but you mm. know you gotta still give it your yes yes whether it's one or 100 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, have, I have to give them a, a, a fantastic show yeah it's 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 not easy and i think we need to educate our supporters Mm -hmm. You know, we need to educate our supporters. I heard a term yesterday, um, somebody, I was on a Zoom and somebody said, oh, you're preaching to the choir. And somebody came back and said, well, the choir needs more practice. Mm -hmm. You know, so even though we're preaching to the choir, I guess the choir needs more practice, right? So I really love that term. But let's let's take a break and come back. And I want us to talk about the Barata education and outreach piece. Okay. Andrew Clark, my guest for today as we wrap things up. Andrew Clark is a multi-talented artist, MC, organizer, producer, singer, actor, dancer sometimes, singer <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and he's sitting with me on arts, culture, and things in between. I'm Rose October. Andrew, 
-hmm. As we wind down and we talk about the third piece of grant production, which has to do with the education and outreach. Um, tell us a little bit about that. And then I want you to tell me about the upcoming production that you have, because I know that there is something pending. In the pipeline. Yeah. yeah. So education and outreach becomes multi-pronged in and of itself. Uh, we currently do programs in, in two after schools. Uh, so we bring teaching artists into after school programs and, and engage them in the creation of, of art. In, in, in this year's case, we're doing two dance programs. And so we're introducing them to Caribbean dance forms. So we say from um, bachata to, to dance hall, I think is, is, our, is our tagline. Um, and then bachata is a dance form from Puerto Rico, I want to say, okay. but one of our Spanish speaking islands. Okay. Um, so it's showing the range of dance forms that exist within um, the Caribbean space. And then we have senior center programs as well. And we've done quite a few of those, anything ranging from theater, dance, folk singing, visual arts. I mean, if you see our seniors create, dream catchers and paint and use sand to create art. It's, ju it's just fantastic. So this is a similar premise, we bring our teaching artists into the senior center and engage them around the creation of art. And they have, you know, a final show where they exhibit everything they've learned. Always fantastic. Um, so that is our education piece. And then our outreach. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Finish the outreach, I have a question after that. And then our outreach efforts are that encompasses Banker Caribbean Culture Festival, uh, Caribites Festival, which is an event that we normally do in a low to middle income neighborhood. And the idea is to bring a, a, a set of people that may not be the core patrons of Brata um, and our core constituents, Caribbean entertainment, and really to introduce them to the length and breadth of Caribbean culture, not just folk music, um, but all popular forms. And, you know, I like to say, to show them that the Caribbean is more than Jamaica and jerk chicken, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's Caribites. And then we have our Christmas celebration, which is Grand Market. It used to be called Old Time Grand Market. Now it's gonna be called Christmas Grand Market. Um, so that's, our, that's how we reach out into the community. Two of those three programs are free. Okay. Now, with respect to funding, mm -hmm. who are your funders? Uh, our fund, our primary funder is the Department of Cultural Affairs, um, which which the funds are made possible through a number of city council members. Uh, so there's Denise Miller, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Van Bramer, Rory Lanceman, um, Adrian Adams. I am forgetting one other, Donovan Richards. And this is specific to the Queens area, right? In Queens, yes. Because that's where you guys are located. Oh, and one funder, one council member in Brooklyn, Alika Amfrey. Okay. Yes. So in terms of a Queens Arts Council funding and no? We get a, we, we had to cycle off Queens Arts Council for a little while and then we, we went back on this time and the, the funding ended up being on the lower end, very, very low end of the spectrum. Um, so that's an interesting, because at one point we got, re, we got up to their maximum, which was 5,000 for our production, which fantastic as it might be, 5,000, you know, doesn't pay for a musical yeah. oh, any no. production yeah, by right. any stretch, you know, but this time we managed to end up on the lower end of the spectrum. So it was, it's an interesting thing because, you know, with a lot of the arts councils there, they have um, panels that meet. So it's, it's really human, human error or, or expertise that ends up deciding yeah. you know, who is, who is fundable and at the, and what level you're funded at. And what is fundable. And yes, what is fundable. Absolutely. Yeah. I've had, it's interesting. We tried to get funding from the New York State Council on the Arts and a, a white gentleman told me that Barata folk singers is not authentic folk. 
it's not considered traditional folk, so we would not be eligible for funding because we use a keyboard and we choreograph and we have, um, we choreograph and we arrange the music. And my thought was, so you're really gonna have us go <laughs> truly, truly authentic when the form is already struggling yeah. for notoriety and struggling to survive you're going to tell me that in order for us to get your $5,000, we've got to peer down and go back to when we didn't have no costumes and we were singing in country with no, 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 no musicianship, no attention right. to detail, no choreography. And you really think that that's something that the public would, what an insult. would always enjoy. It's like, you know, people want, people want theater, you know, and, and, if you go to Broadway, everything is oh yeah, fully put together. So why can't folk arts exist in the same space yeah, and still be I authentic? Like you know, we're still doing good work. We're still preserving culture that's not mainstream. Yeah, but, I mean, you, you know, have to stylize it. You have to commercialize it. I hate to say, but you have you to. You have to, unfortunately. It's oh, either yeah. that or you're going to remain a purist yeah. and 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 we're oh, gonna yeah. we're gonna fade into obscurity. Yep, 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 yep. We do it with Quack Quack. Mm -hmm. But um, we're on the button of five o'clock. I know you wanted to talk about the upcoming production that you have. Ah, yes, yes, yes. We're under the, the, the wire now because, as I said, the funders are requiring that we, we do um, this programming before the 30th of June, which I just got the notice three days ago. So when I while I had a month to to prepare and produce Bankra, we only have the better part of two weeks to make that happen, as well as a Brata Folk Singers concert. Mm. So, when I tell you, I, it's sleepless nights because we're just ra frantically trying to figure out one, how do we put together a production that is worthy of putting our names on. But also, like I said earlier, the bar was set really high with Bankra and we have to live up to that. So, you know, I we're, we're, we're working hard, you know, and we're hopeful, we're remaining hopeful that we can make it happen. Just frantically trying to find artists to fill the, fit the bill. I'd, I'd already started to uh, converse with some potential artists, but they were told we weren't going up until July. So folks are not ready, you know, they're not ready to go. People are... <laughs> people are coming at varying levels of coming out of quarantine. Some people have returned to work. So their lives have changed, yeah. you know, in the last month or so since I spoke, I, I first engaged them. So I, I do uh, believe you can do it though. I do believe. I do believe. Me, we're going to have to. That okay. much I know. That much we're, we're going to have to come, come heck or high water. Yes. We're going to have to yes. make it happen. So, so listen. I've been touting Andrew is a singer, he's a, he's a singer, he's a, he's a singer, actor, he's a singer, actor, MC, he's a singer. Yeah. I don't want to come over like if I'm a farce because we haven't really heard you sing. We sing the Trinidad song earlier. I'll do oh, it. Yes. Oh, it wasn't an key. Mind you, it wasn't, it wasn't the right key. <laughs> what, what do you want me to sing? I don't know. Sing something. Ah, lordy, 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 lordy. Um, if you were to I sing something to your daddy, what would you sing? Oh, um, uh, you raise me up so I can stand on mountain. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. Thank you. Thank you for clearing my name so people would know that I'm not making things up. Ladies and gentlemen, viewership, boys and girls, we've just sat through with Andrew Clark again, a true brother of the Caribbean soil, doing great work. Keep up the good work. I'm so proud of you, proud to be called your friend. Um, just keep pushing on. I know you got it in you and resilience keeps you going and you know when you feel as though you can't do it anymore you can always 
call me. I know, I know. yes, I'm yes. Here, yeah. and I want to really congratulate you on that huge production of Bankra, the Caribbean Culture Festival. Um, awesome job. Congratulations to you and the team. And we're looking forward to more work yes, of yeah. Bankra Productions. And thank you, Rose, for being such a stern supporter. I mean, no, me can't call upon you. A, a, a real big mission of, of mine, a personal mission, has been to really bring Caribbean practitioners of culture together. And I can say unreservedly that you have been one of those persons that have, have just come on board. It's like you just adapt brata and you're like, I don't know if we can get the rest of the Guyanese massive, but know that I will be there and you've been there every single time. So I thank you for that. And this program, you know, is, is such a great platform for giving voice and space to our cultural artists, you know, that quite often um, sometimes go unheralded. Not that we're doing it for accolades, but it's great, you know, to be able to share space with, you know, work people of, of similar mind. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, my dear. So on that note, we're saying thank you again for joining us, but a big thank you to the man behind this, the shy, yes, I said it, mm -hmm. the shy, Raul De Silva, our technical engineer. This, this professional is so good, so great at what he does. He can do this with his eyes closed. I know he's probably with his eyes closed right now because he's working around the clock. And Raul, we sincerely thank you. I sincerely thank you. And when I say we, I'm talking on behalf of Andrew too, because we've all worked together. Yeah. And would like to say thank you to Raul the Silva of rdepros.com. Please check him out. His work is awesome. And I hope that you can get some sleep, Raul. I don't know how and when, but hey, and thank you. Thank you, Raul. Thank you for everything you do. And thank you, thanks to you, our viewership, for joining us today. My guest was Andrew Clark of the Barata Productions. He's the executive director and fun founder of Barata Productions. On that note, please have a pleasant evening and a pleasant week ahead. Bye-bye. All right.